Grace, mercy, and peace be to you in God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So once more for our gospel reading, we are returning to that upper room on Maundy Thursday, as on the night when he was betrayed, our Lord prepares us for what is to come after everything has been accomplished in this post-Easter and now post-Ascension reality in which he leaves his church. So at this point in the evening, he has already warned the disciples about the upcoming betrayal. He has predicted his death. He has foretold that Peter will deny him three times. He does give a bit of a break in the bad news, though. We do get the true vine discourse here where he still assures them there is joy to be found in abiding with him and that as his disciples, they shall be called friends of God. But it's a little short-lived because then he quickly goes back into the negative warning them that Being disciples means they should also expect to be persecuted, hated, and falsely accused, just as their master is about to be. Suffice to say, they're not really in the best of moods by the time we get to today's reading in chapter 16. Still, there, there is something of another turning point in that dialogue, as here Jesus promises that when all is said and done, before they are sent into the world to carry the message as he has for the last three years, the Holy Spirit will be given to them. He will bear witness about the Lord. He will strengthen and embolden them to do the same as he works faith within them and keeps them united as the Holy Church with its mission to proclaim the good news throughout the world. Still, the disciples don't necessarily seem to realize how great this news is. For when we continue with the reading today and Jesus once more proclaims he's leaving, he points out this time the disciples don't even bother to ask, where are you going? And the reason they don't ask isn't just because, you know, they've asked this before and they already know the answer, but it's because they don't want to have to address the answer. Jesus flat out says, because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. They may not recognize all the details, but they know enough that they'd rather pretend it's not really happening. You know, why should they want to dwell on his arrest and suffering and death? Why not just, you know, push it back? into the back of their minds, try to enjoy what time is left. You know, we've all been in those kind of awkward situations with the elephant in the room. But then comes the truly puzzling statement of it all. I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. Now, I touched on this a little bit last week, but doesn't it feel a lot of the time like it would be better if Jesus had remained on earth to continue giving his leadership and guidance, wouldn't that be to our advantage? Wouldn't we all prefer that he were here to just settle our theological disputes so that we didn't have a great schism of 1054 and we didn't need a reformation of 1517 and we didn't have false teachers leading people astray with bad theology in the here and now? Wouldn't the disciples rather have had him around in the early days of the church to offer them guidance, give them reassurances that yes, you are supposed to go to India or Rome or Spain or wherever their next mission trip is and let them know they truly are acting according to plan? How could it possibly be to anyone's advantage for Jesus to ascend into heaven and leave us here below? I mean, yes, we do get him interceding for us before the Father's throne like we talked about in last week's sermon, but it seems to me he could just as easily pray for us while still being incarnate on the earth, right? Well, fortunately, Jesus does not leave us hanging here. He gives us the reason why it is to our advantage. He says, if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. There you go. If Christ does not ascend, he does not send the Holy Spirit to us. I won't claim to know for sure why he has to ascend in order for the Holy Spirit to come. I can make an educated guess, but at the end of the day, I'm fine just treating this as a divine mystery and saying that's how Jesus says it has to be, so I'm going to accept on faith that that is how it has to be. And so, on this Pentecost Sunday, when we remember the Holy Spirit being sent out to God's people on earth in a special way, a way he hadn't been before, now he dwells within us in the founding of the church, we remark how this truly is to our advantage, how it is worth Jesus' ascension for us to have this gift. Now, 
But at the risk of sounding irreverent, perhaps it's a little bit hard at first to see why this trade-off, for lack of a better term, really is to our advantage. Again, it would be really nice if the church could be united in the world and pool all of our resources together for the common good and work together to spread the full truth of the gospel, not being fractured into all of these denominations, squabbling with each other and usually getting too distracted by our differences to really focus on the mission as we ought. And let's face it, we all have our very Christ-centered reading of the Bible, so we probably don't really talk about the Holy Spirit as much as we should. And he often becomes kind of the, the silent partner in the Trinity. So perhaps it is a little bit harder for us Lutherans off the top of our heads to recognize just why it matters so much to have him dwelling with us in a way he didn't before Pentecost and why this is worth Jesus no longer being among us in the way we wish that he was. Fortunately, again, Jesus foretells all of this. He doesn't, so he wants more. He does not leave us wondering. He preemptively answers this question. He tells us what role the Spirit will play when he arrives. He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, which that maybe doesn't sound like the happiest of things. Maybe it's not the most reassuring of things at first, but let's look into it a little bit more on why Jesus sends the Holy Spirit to the world. So first we need to address that word convict, because I know in our modern usage that's really only used in the context of courtrooms when someone is convicted of a crime, but it can also mean, and I think this is the sense in which Jesus is using it here, to bring to light, to expose, or especially when dealing with convicting the world concerning sin, to bring a person to the point of recognizing wrongdoing. So Jesus is not sending the Holy Spirit into the world to render judgment against the world and condemn humanity. We know Jesus came to save the world, not to condemn it. And we know it's the role of the Son to judge the living and the dead, as we just said in the Creed. Rather, the Spirit comes to make us aware of our own sinful estate, of the fact that on our own power we do stand condemned before our righteous God, and we have a desperate need for a Savior in the first place. He is diagnosing us so we can recognize just how bad our illness is. This is the role of the Spirit. He creates and maintains the church by being the means by which God then grants faith to his believers. The Holy Spirit calls and unites us into this fellowship as the people of God. He grants us the faith necessary to recognize, even recognize that we cannot make ourselves righteous before the Father, to understand his holy and perfect law that has been given to us and to realize just how far we have fallen from keeping it, lest we all be led astray into thinking that we're good enough on our own. The Holy Spirit does not convict us by declaring us guilty in a court of law. He merely shows us how guilty we already are so that we can recognize what our situation is. But that's only one-third of what Jesus said. He also convicts us regarding righteousness. For Jesus goes to the Father and we see him no longer, so now we must believe without having seen, to paraphrase, paraphrase his words to Thomas. And yet we also recognize that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. Christ won our righteousness on the cross and his teachings on the matter are vindicated by his resurrection and ascension, but our access to that forgiveness earned for our sake is available and grasped only through faith. We could not truly believe his words nor receive his gifts if the Holy Spirit did not enlighten us to these things and reveal them to us as he calls us into the church as the body of believers. And because he grants us this faith by which we receive the righteousness of Christ, we, now are, we are now privileged to stand in a proper relationship and position regarding God's judgment. For the ruler of this world, Satan, and through him sin and death, stand judged already as Christ struck that killing blow over Easter against them. And as surely as Satan's fate is now written in stone, so too are the fates of those who follow the ways of the world rather than the ways of God. His judgment is foretold and inevitable. But those who have received the righteousness of Christ 
through that faith granted by the Holy Spirit are set apart from condemnation, but instead have the assurance of salvation as we are judged according to what Christ has given us, the forgiveness of sins and the promise of life eternal. The Holy Spirit reveals these things to us by working in and through the word of God in the scriptures and the sacraments which Christ left behind for us, the very markings of the church. And indeed, the Holy Spirit forms and maintains his church for the world's sake. For consider this as you read through the gospel accounts. While there are brief periods where, you know, the disciples are sent out to the surrounding towns and villages on their own, the whole time Christ walked to the earth incarnate were marked mostly by them traveling with him, which, fair enough, I would do the same if I had the chance. But notice this also means the message really doesn't extend very far beyond Judea. So if Jesus is here incarnate, who's going to leave him to go halfway across the world, right? But when he is gone, when he's ascended into heaven, it forces the disciples to go out into the world. And then as you read through the book of Acts, you see how all of this is directed by the Spirit. So rather than just cloistering around Jesus in Galilee or Nazareth, they spread out into the known world. They establish congregations. They ordain pastors. They declare the gospel as they have been tasked. All of this under the guidance of the Spirit, who then uses the word of God as the means by which he continues to grant faith to those who hear it. So that we re as we read the Bible, we see that the message of the gospel does not just remain in Judea, but it goes to Europe, to Asia Minor and the East, to Africa, and eventually, you know, outside the Bible, it spreads to Australia and the Americas. And Buzz Aldrin even took communion on the moon in the Apollo 11 module. So I'm a little wary about self-administered communion like that. But still... The church continues to grow. The word of God continues to be proclaimed. And new members are brought into a saving faith by that work of the Holy Spirit who still guides his church here on earth that all may rightly glorify our Lord as it has been declared through him. Through the Holy Spirit, we have faith by which we receive these gifts of the church. By him, we truly know all that our Lord has done for us. By him, we are able to tell those around us of God's love for humanity because through him, we see how God showed his love for us. That is why it is to our advantage to have the Holy Spirit indwelling in us in this way. So on this day of Pentecost, let us give thanks for the perhaps underappreciated third person of the Trinity. Let us give thanks that he has indeed called us to be here as the church. And let us give thanks that he has given us the truth and enabled us to place our trust in our Lord and Savior. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until the life everlasting. Amen.